first of all, um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Veronica. I work as a UX designer uh, in a software company called Candico. And uh, just very briefly, uh, Candico has uh, two strong products on the market, uh, both content management systems. Um, and we definitely believe, um, you know, how it's saying, um, sharing is caring. So that's one of the reasons why we regularly host these design events. Um, yeah, just to show, share our knowledge uh, with design community. Um, and we couldn't be able to host it without speakers. So I'm happy to introduce today's speakers who are my dear colleagues. Um, they are Martina and Tomáš. They just, uh, yeah, they are on the camera right now. <laughs> Martina is um, an experienced content developer. And uh, today she will walk you through some basics of uh, UX writing. Uh, she'll share, uh, she will share some useful UI copy do's and don'ts. So I think that would be really interesting. And in the second part, Tomáš, who is our customer education leader, um, he will continue with um, uncovering these like hidden corners of UX writing, uh, in particular, um, the terminology of login, signing, register, all these stuff that are, I would say, like the entry gate for many users to the product. And they're still like kind of messy and uh, not united. Many people are tricked by those terms. So I'm also very looking forward to this one to find out like what to finally choose. <laughs> and uh, there will be, um, of course, Q&A session at the end of this event. So feel free to drop questions to Slido. You can see it on the screen right now with the code design hour. So we will go through it later. And I believe this is all from me uh, for the start. And I will hand it over to Martina right now. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. So this one. So hopefully you can see it now. If not, please let me know. Yes, and, we can see uh, it. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Vacha. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, I'd like to also start by just welcoming you guys here and thank you all for coming. And it's always appreciated, of course. And let's get down to business. Um, I've chosen this name for my presentation because I guess we all know what Lorem Ipsum is. It's kind of a dummy content that you use to fill in your design. And maybe some of you have even used it before. Um, hopefully not. But if you did, I hope hearing my talk today will persuade you to not do that again. Because preparing UI copy for your design doesn't have to be scary at all. And before we get into my presentation, I'd like to quickly just ask you one question, ask you all. Uh, there's a chat window in here, if you can find it. And I would like to hear about your current job position, if you don't mind it sharing because I would like to get to know our audience a bit better. I would like to know whether you're a UX designer already, if you're a UX writer maybe, or if you're not in the technical field at all, um, or maybe your original plans just fell through and now you're here with us, that's, that's all fine. So if you don't mind it sharing uh, with us, here's the chat window, I'm just gonna say hi, so you know where it is, <laughs> there you go. Um, and I'm going to just continue with, uh, with my presentation and look at this a bit later. So, uh, again, just uh, reminding you that if you have any questions during my presentation or during Tom's presentation, just go to Slido and enter the code design hour. We'll answer all of these questions after both our presentations are over. Okay, so I'd like to start by quickly introducing myself to you. So, hi, uh, I'm Martina and I've been living in Brno for quite some time now. Uh, I've studied information technology at Brno University of Technology and I started working as a content developer at Kentico three years ago. Uh, if you're wondering uh, why I'm using a picture of a butter fence or LF fly, if you will, uh, it's because it's kind of fitting to my job description. Uh, I'm kind of a mixed bag myself. So uh, when you divide the name into content and the developer, you'll kind of get what I mean. The content part of it is 
all about writing all things technical, writing tutorials for our CMS product, which is content with a K, uh, providing developers with the API reference, uh, code samples, testing product, it's, it's all there. Uh, but also, a big part of my job is communicating. Communicating with different roles here at Cantico. Uh, it's mostly with the developers, uh, but also UX designers. So that's especially when it comes to UI copy, which we're going to cover today. And there are also some various custom-facing roles. You just name it. Um, but enough about me. Let's get into this. So it might seem uh, like this slide is missing some text, perhaps. Uh, but actually, that's kind of the point. Imagine a world without any text in it. So you get up in the morning and you'd like to start off your day with just maybe reading some news, checking your emails, or maybe reading a couple of tweets. Uh, but if the text is gone, you can't really do any of that, can you? You might argue that these are all very text-based apps and it's not always like that. So here's a picture of an internet movie database. Oh, sorry, here's a picture of a movie database. Uh, probably a lot of you know this. Uh, it's IMDB or uh, internet movie database for, for longer. Uh, imagine you want to check out a movie, your friend just recommended basically, to see if it's any good. So the only thing you get from this without any text is a movie poster or a picture that you can see here, which is nice, but it doesn't tell you much. You don't know what the movie is about, who's the director, and more importantly, what's the score? Because if it's anything under seven, you probably don't want to watch it. So what I'm trying to say here is the importance of the text. Because visitors don't come to your website for design, even though it sounds cruel, they come for information. And with no words on the design, even if it's developed by the latest UX trends, users will get lost. And continuing with the movie topic, actually, uh, have you ever spent your evening just mindlessly browsing Netflix instead of actually watching a movie? I guess we all know this, and it's when you have too many options that you get stuck, unable to make a decision. And this excessive thinking is called cognitive overload. It describes the amount of mental effort that's used to accomplish a task. So if you're now thinking like, why am I talking about this all of a sudden? Uh, it's because this is all part of the user experience. And cognitive overload really is our biggest enemy here. Both the design and the UI copy should work together to prevent it. So what makes the user overthink something? First of all, it's the number of unnecessary tasks that, uh, that the user needs to do. And all of this adds to their cognitive load. Then there's overstimulation. So if your interface is distracting in either way, or chaotic somehow, it derails a user from the task at hand. And then there's the last thing that we've actually covered with the Netflix example, that's when you have too many options. So the more options a user has, the more time they'll be all take to make a decision. And we want to reduce cognitive overload for a better user experience. Uh, customers coming to your app should instantly feel comfortable navigating your app, finding the things they need, and so that they don't have any more questions, basically. And this simply cannot be achieved by the design alone, however beautiful it may be. Now, uh, this is going to be fun. I guess now is a perfect time to quickly just check if it's all the designers against me or if there's someone someone other than that. Oh, I can see, okay, there's quite a mix. I can see that there are some UI designers, some researchers even, copywriters. Okay, okay, so this is gonna be interesting. Thank you, thank you for participating. Uh, I guess most of you know that uh, the process of creating the UI copy, um, well, most of you probably know it from the other side of things, uh, from the designer's point of view, but I would like to take a moment here and talk about Oh, 
story, <laughs> talk about uh, how creating the UI copy should go hand in hand with preparing the design. So it should never be the last thing on your mind once the design is final. Uh, I cannot tell you uh, how many times I've heard something like, here's the final design and we just need a small copy, like one sentence to explain all of these things about the feature, like how it works and what happens when you click this, okay? Not okay, uh, because here's all the secret. The less words you want in the design, the more time I need to spend on this. So when the design is final, uh, you won't get much wiggle room in there. And this makes it harder for me and for the designer as well. Also, uh, keep in mind that the copy is often the most human part of the entire interaction with your product. So it's the part where you're communicating with the user, answering their questions and giving them feedback. It's crucial to start creating text as quickly as possible because problems with writing clear and concise text often identify a problem in the UX design itself. So it's much easier to solve these problems at an early stage. And one more thing, if I need to explain something in a long paragraph of like three or more sentences, it's quite possible that something's wrong with the design. And again, I'm not trying to be mean, but text should never fix a poor design. That, that's just a fact. There's someone who's unmuted, so if you please can mute yourself, that would be lovely because there's some noise in the background. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's get into the very basics of UX writing. You can think of this like uh, UX writing 101, if you will. Uh, the most important thing of all is always put your customers first. Think about them when writing the copy so that you know what you need to say. You need to know who these users are, what's the persona behind the screen, and what sort of questions they might ask. Um, also, it matters what their initial knowledge is, because imagine someone's a technical persona or someone's your 70 years old grandmother. These are both very different things. And so the copy should differ too. In your text, uh, you should try to use common language because as we've said already, uh, UI copy is all about communicating with the user. It's sort of like you're having a conversation with them and it should feel natural. So avoid complicated sentences, phrasal verbs, idioms that uh, your non-native speakers might not understand and just be human. Uh, think about this like you're explaining how the interface works to your friend. Uh, but also, don't forget your brand's voice and tone, because all you write should be in line with how your company wants to present itself to the world. So, uh, always start with the most important thing you have to say. And if you're asking why, uh, it's because, well, let's face it, people don't like to read. It's just a general fact that users just usually skim through the text uh, instead of actually reading it. And this makes our position a bit harder as we really need to make sure that they at least read the most crucial thing. And it can also help if you draw attention to it. Uh, this can be either achieved by the design itself or maybe by just making the one important part of the text bold or by using a bigger font, you know, the options are there. Uh, the next thing is, well, don't forget about reviews. Uh, let someone else look at your prepared copy with a fresh pair of eyes. This can help you uncover any flaws that might be there. Uh, someone can understand what you meant a bit differently, perhaps. So never underestimate reviews because nobody's perfect. And last but not least, uh, use the right amount of information. Don't make your users read a long wall of text just because. Uh, as we've said earlier, too much information 
adds to the cognitive load and we really want to avoid that. Okay, so as you said, uh, getting yourself in your customer's shoes is something that could, ha could help you create a better UI copy. Uh, this can also be done by asking a couple of simple questions when preparing your text. When confirming an action or clicking some button, users want to feel safe. Uh, they want to know what happens if they do this or that, or if they don't do something, especially if it's something uh, that might be unpleasant. Uh, we should also uh, set their expectations correctly. Like how many steps do they need to take before they can purchase a product? If you know that the process only takes three steps, for example, there's a higher chance that you'll sell till the, till the end and buy this product. Or when registering for a site or filling a form, you might also want to know what else is needed to finish it. So that's one of the other questions. What else do I need? Um, and last, uh, the last one uh, kind of goes along with the first what if question. Uh, users want to know that nothing's set in stone. Like if they pick a username for your site, uh, they might want to change it later. So let them know that this is possible. So they are reassured somehow. So that's the, the last question, right? So what if I change my mind later? Um, wait, okay, good. <laughs> Right, so now we'll go through some of the most common UI elements and I'll explain how to create a proper copy for them and what things you need to avoid when doing so. So let's start with the buttons. Uh, when preparing a copy for buttons, your goal is to make sure that it is clear what happens after you click it. Uh, there should be no confusion or double meaning as to what the button does. Uh, this is especially important when the primary action is destructive in nature, such as when cancelling things or deleting them. Let's look at uh, the example here. Uh, we're starting off with um, cancelling copy at the very top and then move on to reject the file as the heading. But the options we have here are OK and Cancel. So which one is the right one you want to click? I guess we'll never know because this is in no way a good UI copy. In cases like this one, you want to make it obvious which action actually means cancelling or in this case, rejecting the file. What would help here in this situation is to Simply use the word reject as your main option. Maybe even uh, use red to emphasize that this is sort of a distraction, uh, destructive action. Uh, this is actually what we do in our product and I think it really helps to see the difference between the two buttons. Uh, also, try to always use a verb as the, as the main action that the user is trying to do instead of a simple yes or no or maybe just okay because um, it just brings more clarity to it. Uh, here's the interesting notification that you might see and it's one of the things that you can quite commonly see nowadays actually and it's called confirm shaming. So uh, this is some kind of a medical application that wants, uh, wants to send you notifications and the negative response to this is, no, I prefer to bleed to death. Right. Even if it might sound funny, hopefully not, uh, it's not okay to use this. Confirm shaming is the act of guilting the user into choosing something they don't actually want to. This is kind of a shady technique of, um, for example, making someone subscribe to your mailing list or turning their notifications on. Uh, word of advice, try to avoid this. It will not be rewarding in the long run, however funny it may sound. Uh, let's move on to error messages now. To write a good error message, you just need to do three things. First, 
explain what happened, include enough information so that users can actually make sense of it, uh, then explain why did this happen, and last but not least, what they can do to resolve the issue. So basically explain how they can fix this. So we've got what happened, why it happened, and how they can fix this. Um, it's always useful to use a friendly, non-technical tone of voice uh, because users just don't care about technical details behind this error. They want to fix it and move on with their task. And again, uh, try to get into your customer's shoes. How might the user feel in this situation? If it's a stressful or serious issue, a silly tone would probably be inappropriate. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at the error here on this slide. It tells you absolutely nothing about the issue, as you can see. And apparently, you can act like the error never happened if you press no. Like no, I refuse to believe it. Um, I'm not sure what happened here, but yeah, that's definitely not a good one. But let's see this one for a change. So. Here's an example of a 404 error or page not found error that I guess most of us um, really know. And this is found on the IMDB website again. And what's interesting here is that they're using the movie theme uh, even for their error messages. So in this case, uh, you can see that there's a quote from, from Star Wars and it is nicely, just nicely goes along with the theme of the web page. So it doesn't always have to be negative. That's, that's the main point, basically. Um, you can just make the experience a bit less, bit less, neg oh, bit less negative, pretty much. And that's definitely a good thing. And here's another one in which I would like to hear your opinion if, if you're willing to share it. So just look at the website, look at the UI copy that you see here, and there are also some useful links. So I will go through this in a second, but if you can just share in the in the chat below, like what do you think about this? Do you think this copy is fine? Do you think it's any good or do you see any problems here? I'm just gonna quickly go through it with you, but you can still share your opinion in the chat. So you can see that uh, Emirates, which is a traveling uh, well, website for booking tickets, basically, um, has a UI copy that's kind of related to what they're doing. So it's sort of a fun, like we've traveled the globe, but we can't seem to find this page, which is OK. And then they have some uh, useful links, as they call it. Uh, and there's one thing that I actually, um, that's actually not in the picture, but there's a search bar at the very end of the message. And then there's a picture of some of their flight attendants, I guess. I'm just going to quickly look at if anyone's uh, sharing their opinion. Okay, I see that Adam likes it and that their options were to go next. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so everyone's quite, kind of okay with it, as I can see. Well, what's interesting, uh, I actually thought that the UI copy is fine. I quite liked it. And then I realized that there was a feedback. There was a real feedback from people using their website. Uh, and people were saying that they don't like it, that these nice, uh, lovely ladies are laughing at their misery when they are unable to find something. So they actually change it. They, if you now go to Emirates and um, just put to the URL uh, 404, you'll find a plane instead of these lovely ladies. So it's the details that matter. Like the UI copy is fine, the useful links are all good, and then you have the image that screws it all, which is, which is kind of funny, I think. But at least they listen to the feedback, so that's definitely good. Um, Right, the next thing we have here are tooltips. Tooltips seem to be kind of the most uh, misused elements in the UI, but it doesn't have to be like that. When you're considering using a tooltip for something in your UI, 
ask yourself, always ask yourself first, is the information in the tooltip necessary for users to complete a task? If the answer is no, a tooltip is well suited. Otherwise, the information should be present on the screen. Simply put, uh, tooltips shouldn't be essential for the task that the user needs to accomplish on your site. If a button or other object requires the users to keep checking a tip to understand it, the design is bad, fix the design instead. We have uh, two examples in here. One is a tooltip for what a password should contain when creating an account. And the other one is for the recipient email address. So again, just quick questions, um, if, you, if you're willing to share it. Which one do you think is, um, is a proper tooltip and which one do you think is used correctly? So it contains the proper information that the tooltip should have. So a quick, quick, quick question. Let's see what you all think. And um, again, I'm going to explain what, what is happening here. Okay, I see I've got already got some answers. Not correct is the password one. Okay. The one for password makes sense. Okay, so there are some divided answers here. So let's go and look at this. Uh, so the password one um, is basically for when you're creating an account um, and it's part of the process, but this type of information is essential to a user successfully completing the create an account process. And therefore it, it should always be present on the screen. So actually the password one is wrong. It's, it's a wrong use of tooltip. The other example on the other end uh, is about an email address. And uh, I think uh, you can all see what's going on here. When we are overlooking the unfortunate placement of it, because that's sort of not important right now, uh, it's kind of a non-essential information, but a useful one. So this means that the tooltip is a good choice in here. Um, and regarding the placement, actually, uh, the tip should never be placed in a way that interferes with what the user is trying to do. So that's why I was like, okay, this is unfortunate, but the tooltip tool uh, itself is correct. Um, and right, uh, so it's okay to use the tooltip uh, for a feature that is not being used that often, or for a feature that might be otherwise maybe interpreted differently. So these are all correct use cases. Now, let's see what else we got. Okay, forms. This is, I think this is the last thing actually, we're going to be talking about uh, forms. Uh, filling in a form uh, is kind of a necessary evil, I think that we all have to deal with from time to time. So let's try to make the experience a bit better for the users if we can. Um, when preparing a UI copy for a form, it's always a good idea to first go through the questions that I mentioned in the beginning. So like what happens if, what else do you need to fill in the form, etc. Uh, for example, if you know that the user needs his passport information, let them know, let them know so they don't need to get up in the middle of the session. Also, uh, if there's some kind of personal information that you need from them, explain why you need this. As we've seen in the tooltip section before for the recipient address, I think, um, because people will be more likely to give you the information when they know how you're going to use it, basically. And now let's talk about the error messages that are shown in the forms. You should always position the message right next to the field that it belongs to so that the user immediately knows what's wrong. There's nothing wrong than filling out the form and after clicking submit, seeing like 10 different errors throughout the form. By then you would probably just leave the site instead of correcting the fields. Let's look at the example here. Uh, the placement's fine. Uh, you can clearly see that the message belongs to the name field, but by saying you didn't enter a name, 
we are kind of blaming the user. Well, not kind of, we're blaming the user and we don't want to do that. So the placement's fine, the UI copy is definitely not. Uh, here's another one. So uh, here's an email address form, right? Email address field that is um, filled in incorrectly. And we can see that the error itself is kind of floating around like a tooltip, which again, unfortunate, but let's, uh, let's focus on what's in it. And right, so we see that the email address is invalid, but that's all we know. Like, why is the address invalid? We may never know. If we want to see how it should look like, however, um, so this is kind of like what the previous message could have been written like. We're not blaming the user and we're explaining how they can fix this with an example of the correct email format. So this is nice. It's, it's quite long, yes, but it explains what happened and what you need to do to fill it in correctly. And that's what we're aiming for at all costs. <laughs> Right, and yeah, I could actually talk about this for the next hour, but we don't have this kind of time here. So that's it from me for today. Uh, I hope it was at least a bit helpful to you and thank you for your attention. Again, uh, you can put your questions at Slido, hashtag uh, design hour, and we will answer them after both of our presentations because uh, now that I've done, it's Tom's turn and I hope you're all excited. So thank you once again and Tom, all is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. I'll just share the screen and we can start it off. Yes, I guess this is it. Yes, okay. Now uh, to a deep dive of a UX writing problem. One of the UX writing things to solve within the UI copy, and not only there, uh, is the terminology. And I'm going to talk about uh, the ter ter terminology for getting in and out of a product and becoming a member of a product. I'm sure all of you have seen login, logout, but also sign in and sign out. Uh, there are also other variants, and in the other camp, we have register, sign up, become a member, and many, many more. So hi, once again, uh, I'm Tom, and welcome to login, sign out, register. What's the best combo? Uh, to introduce myself, I've been in the uh, educational area uh, in IT for about six years now. I started as a technical writer, and now I'm a team leader of Kentico Contents Customer Education Team. Uh, with Martina and others, we take a recommendation, training, other educational materials. And since we don't have any specialized UX writer at the moment, um, part of our job is to formulate the UI copy. Uh, if you uh, like to ask the questions, uh, I once again repeat that go to Slido and there's uh, put their design hour hashtag. At first sight, uh, the internet uh, is divided. On their home pages, Amazon uh, has sign in and start here. Facebook has login and sign up. Microsoft uses sign in and create account. As a UX writer, and I guess it would be similar to UX designers, we have a couple of them here, uh, you're looking for a pattern that you could use. And uh, a problem of terminology like this is a typical problem for UX writers. It's also a problem where uh, there's no clear answer because there's not an authority covering this at this moment. I've dealt with this specific piece of terminology three times already uh, for Kentico's products uh, during my time here at Kentico, and I've always done a bit of research on this topic. Funnily enough, every time I looked into it, uh, I came to different results, at least partially. One thing that can change your results uh, is the type of your app or device. In this case, I'm going to be looking for the right combo for uh, SaaS solutions, software as a service, as Kentic Content uh, is a SaaS app. Though 
in this case, I must say that the right answer wouldn't differ that much in other uh, in other cases. So what's the correct combo? Well, the deeper I was getting into this problem, the more complex it seemed. Uh, not only are there three different terms to check, getting in the product, getting out of the product, and of course becoming a member of the product, there are also multiple variants of the terms we have. There is noun, there is the adjective, there is the verb, and of course there is the URL path. And to make it even more complicated, uh, there is also the preposition usage uh, for the verb of getting in. And by that I mean whether into, for example, in log into or sign into, is written together as into or separately with a space as into. The first thing that you'd probably do is to conduct a proper user research and find out. But uh, this one, this is one of the most frequently used UI copy. Someone must have done research already, right? Well, to check it out, I started looking. First, I checked the style guides, as they should be the knowledge basis for especially these situations. I chose those I consider the most famous, um, Microsoft Writing Style Guide, Google Developer Documentation Style Guide, MailChimp's Content Style Guide, and Wikipedia Manual of Style. But to be honest, they are only somewhat useful. Uh, there are three problems with them. Uh, they focus just on a small subset of the problem, for example, Microsoft recommends sign in and sign out, yet they don't say anything about becoming a member of the product. And it's similar with most of the style guides. Others may ignore nouns, uh, the preposition usage, or getting out. Uh, style guides are just not complete in this. Then some of these companies actually break their own guidelines. Again, Microsoft uh, in an example, they uh, forbid using hyphenated sign-in for nouns, but you can find it in their documentation. And finally, they contradict each other. Opposed to Microsoft, Google approves the sign-in uh, with a hyphen. But then MailChimp, whose guidelines I guess are most complete from this point of view, uh, talks about login instead of sign-in. So that, that's not a problem per se, but if we are looking for the right uh, for the right option, one right option, then it's not there. So what to do next? Well, I went to Google and tried one of their comparers. I thought that this is exactly what they are here for. However, looking into their results, there were again problems. They were not conclusive, as the terms can be used in different contexts. Uh, the terms had often two similar results, or different approaches showed contradicting results. And combined with the margin of error in them, uh, I couldn't have built proper conclusions on these results. But at least something, based on the style guides and the Google battles, I found out that almost no one uses log on and log off anymore. So how to continue? Well, I ended up with research. Uh, I decided to go directly to the influencers. I picked 24 different products and websites from different areas of the internet. There are super companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, entertainment companies like Netflix, e-commerce tools, business software, just someone from every corner of the internet. And every combination for each of these sites is unique in something. I can tell you in advance that there are not just a couple of combos. For those 24 products or websites, the terminology is 24 times different. So the thought of having one right option kind of sells away. But maybe if we generalize enough, we could see some trends. So let's look into this and start, let's start with getting inside the product. The data for this summary vary a lot. So I decided to skip smaller deviations like URL paths. They are always a mess. A small amount of uh, contradictory findings, like specific places with a different marketing message, or when they use noun spelling for the verb and vice versa. There are too many contestants. Login with in you know, to separately and sign in separately for verbs, hyphenated for nouns and adjectives, also with into separately. And these are the results. 
The red part is when the terminology was specific for that given term. They only use login or sign in. And the blue ones uh, are those who use both terms to get into the product. Product. So they somewhere use login, somewhere they use sign in. And as you can see, the difference is practically non-existing. Uh, though it confirmed one thing, and that's log on and log off. Uh, they are just not used anymore. So at least we have stretched one one term or two terms. Let's look into getting outside of the product. Similar to the previous screen, we have again two finalists, logout and sign out. This time, no one really uses more different terms for getting outside. And this time, it's also a complete tie. Uh, most of them keep the pairs. If you use login, you use logout. If you use sign in, you use sign out. The only one that switched, uh, that switched was intercom. Uh, if you use intercom, you sign in to your intercom account, yet then you log out from it. And out of these 24 services, intercom is the only one which, with such a change. Uh, also, 9 and Uber use logout together as a verb. So uh, the others follow English rules and have it right. Uh, 9 and Uber, I guess, like English speaking people. Uh, and as we said, as, as Marta said uh, earlier, uh, we should use verbs for buttons. Finally, let's look into the craziest part here, and that's becoming a member of a product. This time, our main two finalists are create an account and sign up. Create account uh, in this column is allowed in any form here. So for example, create an account with, with the indefinite article N or with the brand name, like create Netflix account, anything would go here. Uh, and it seems that sign up has taken a bit of a lead. But if you count the blue ones, which represent that the particular term is used along with other terms, we have approximately 50-50 approximately division again. To make it a bit more interesting, I now change the representation of colors. Orange are those that use login, and blues are those that use sign in. Even though the totals stay the same, it shows a pretty strict division. So loginers use sign up while sign iners tend to create uh, tend to use create an account and the pattern seems to uh, uncover a bit but there is one more level we can dive into now to a crazy table of data uh, the relationship between sign up and login is pretty straightforward so i won't go to uh, into that one and that's why it's grayed out on the other hand, the sign iners, those are those are the orange ones, tend to use both create an account and almost anything else. You can see join, get started, uh, or GitHub they, they, they just, that just uses sign up and create account, both of them. And the ultimate product is LastPass, which uses three different uh, verbs for registration. Get LastPass free, create an account, sign up, it's free. But there is indeed a division that I see as the key division. A lot of services listed here have people becoming members as one of their main objectives. The main purpose of these services is that you become their member and then get into the product as often as possible. So it's in their best interest to spend the time and money on effective research about wording for these sections. For example, social media or Netflix, Spotify, they are all B2C products in need for paying registered end users because the users are everything uh, to them. So the highlighted now are those that I con consider being products or companies that A, focus on B2C and B, the account is part of the company's main business. Now, this part is obviously shady because it's very subjective, but let's go even further and remove those who haven't really changed their microcopy for a long time. So now, Social media, streaming products, and software from shared economy are mostly those who stayed. And these need people to become members more than the rest, because that's how they make money. And once again, I acknowledge that this division was subjective done by me, and you may reach different results if you do this yourself. But uh, I was trying to find a pattern, so let's convert it back to a chart and what it says. 
Now we see clearly that eight out of nine of those big services, B2C services, uh, tell users to sign up, six in all cases, to at least in some cases. To be fair, Netflix uses sign up not, uh, not uh, in the main prominent places uh, because the homepage contains like try 30 days free, similar to LastPass. But even with that, the terminology is clear, just the marketing action is taken up a notch. Another interesting fact is that out of those eight using sign up, seven uses login, six in all cases, one in some cases. Yeah, the data can be filtered, but I think this just isn't coincidental. I then tried to do the same for uh, B2B, uh, where five out of eight have created an account, at least in some part of their website or service. But uh, I find these results to be unreliable uh, because there are so many variants. So I'd say that B2B companies maybe lean towards create an account, maybe because it sounds more official, uh, which is a good thing in B2B, but there are plenty, diff plenty of different approaches. The whole time I was after the one winner, the option that is the best. Well, I didn't find that. And that's what can easily happen for any UX writing problem. There is no authority. There's no, not just one great or good answer. But there are always some outcomes and results from your research. First, some general wisdom from the research that I'd say is uh, like in all cases. As I said a couple of times already, don't use log on and log off. Don't use register as well. Let's throw it in there too. No one really uses it anymore. It's not common. And it seems that the only time it was a thing was early after the year 2000, when the internet was slowly starting. The URL paths don't matter. So don't worry about them that much. You won't be the first or the last to have a mess in them. And even though the little voice inside your head will tell you to unify it, uh, it's actually more normal to have them messed up. Uh, there were like a half of the half of the results of or the products had them sw swapped. And finally, don't forget to keep your style guides. Uh, they should hold these rules. And if style guides agreed back when computers and later the internet started, we would have this unified already and wouldn't have to do the research. Now, let's look into what we found out in the terminology itself. These are the most common combinations uncovered in this presentation. It's a general generalization. Uh, as I said, 24 different products and websites, 24 different uh, terminology, but this is the generalization. In B2C, the safest bet is to go with login with a separate two. The noun and adjective is written together. The URL path would be either login or sign in, both written together without any hyphens. And getting out would be logout and sign up for becoming a member. And for B2B, the preferred variant is sign in with a separate two. The nouns and adjectives would be hyphenated. Uh, the URL path can be both variants, similar to B2C, as I said, just a mess. Uh, for getting out, you'd use sign out and create an account in some form or pretty much anything for become, becoming a member. I must say that this terminology is probably the most messy UX writing problem I've come, come to so far. Typically, it's more straightforward than this, but on the other hand, this is what you get when you tackle such a nightmare. Normally, this would be the end of my presentation and uh, of my example uh, of a UX writing problem. Yet, since we have UX designers uh, and some I or some UX uh, designer as uh, aspires, I'd like to, and you will be like most likely the ones setting this terminology. Let's think about how we can improve the current scene. I mean, it's one step to unify the world to these two, but why not to focus on one specific solution? Let's come up with how, which one of them is better. We're basically looking uh, just for a better one because we can't really expect that if we come up with something new, the world will change. So we need to pick an existing term and push using that one. So I established a couple of questions or categories that we should consider. First, 
are they easy to recognize? Well, I'd say both are, yet the right option, the sign-in, is a little bit worse since you never know what to look for when becoming a member because it's always different. Then the terms should be already understandable and I'd say both, uh, both are since they both won in their categories. Then the terms shouldn't be interchangeable to speed up the process of clicking the desired button. When you have sign in and sign up next to, each, next to each other, it takes much more time before your brain realizes which one you're after. In our two options, login is more similar to sign up as the number of syllables is the same and the preposition looks similarly. So sign in and create account would be better in here. The terms should be short as well. You don't want to have a sentence like words in your user interface or in the documentation. And talking about creating an account is long, it's wordy, it's cumbersome. So that's a no-no for the right column. Next, today's business uh, can be international uh, and English is the prime online language, but many internet users are not strong in it and uh, they are not English native speakers. So we shouldn't start with something that they don't know already. And I haven't done a proper research on this, but from my experience, login and logout is just most famous. Even people that don't speak English, uh, I know, often know these terms. The terms should also be easy to use and follow uh, grammar rules at the same time. Following grammar rules has always been a struggle for sign-in for its noun and adjective variant. I think that we've all seen sign-in being used differently, hyphenated, together, separately, uh, for verb, for, uh, for noun, for adjectives. It just creates friction. And finally, the UL path should be unified. And it is unfortunately not at all on either side. Based on this, the left variant, the login variant, proves to be a bit better. So let's go out from this one and let's try to fix its shortcomings. So if you ever establish getting in and out of a product and becoming a member of a product, I'm suggesting you push for, the, for this. For getting in the product, it will be login with a separate uh, two for login to. Uh, the URL path would be unified, so login. For getting out of the product, it will be logout. And for becoming a member, it would be sign up. Notice that in all cases, the nouns and adjectives are always not hyphenated and written together, similar to the URL path. Besides that, there are two other things. Let's not forget to keep our flag as updated because without that, everyone will use uh, this differently every time and you don't want that. And listen to your conversion metrics. And one thing that I haven't addressed really is that you and your marketing will probably want to have something different in some places because of the conversion it makes. And that's okay actually, because sometimes a more specific call to action is better for marketing materials. For example, start watching your favorite TV series right now might and probably will be better than sign up in some place, typically the homepage of a streaming service. And that's okay, because the terminology is still clear when they're signed up at the top right corner. Thank you for your attention. My name is Tom Nosek, and this was login, logout, sign up. That's the best combo. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, once uh, again reminding Slido Design Hour. Uh, and if you'd like to read more on this topic, you can scan the QR code that, that will take you to a blog post that I wrote about this. Thank you. And now over to Veronica again. Yeah, I will take it from there. Um, thank you, Marta and Tomasz for amazing presentations. I really enjoyed it. And now it's time for questions. So I will share my screen with the Slido questions. There are several ones. So just a second. Okay. So um, there's this one question for Martina. Um, how do you reflect on the copy you write? Do you have a checklist? Do you get feedback from your colleagues or is there something else entirely? Thanks, Lukasz asks. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, this kind of uh, actually depends on the type of the UI copy. Uh, if it's something really small and simple, I just send the text straight away to the developer or designer that needs it. But uh, if it's something more complicated, like a copy for a whole new feature, uh, the process is a bit more challenging, of course. And there's usually this three-way conversation between me, the designer, and the developer at hand. And we give each other feedback and try to reach the decision so that everyone's happy. Basically, it's all about communi communicating. And I don't have any checklist or anything like that. I just uh, go by, go from the experience. But yeah, I really prefer to start the communication as early as possible, as I said at the beginning, actually, of my presentation. So that's the secret. It's just all about communicating, just like everyone, every, everywhere else, basically. <laughs> I hope this answers your question, though. <laughs> We hope so. Or look, as you can, um, yeah, unmute yourself. <laughs> um, but let's consider answered. So another question is, um, where and how do you keep your style guides for copy? How often do you update it? Tom, do you want to take this one? I can. <laughs> so we have a style guide for uh, for uh, generally for writing for any uh, any writing we we create. Uh, I would say we update it well recently pretty often, <laughs> maybe every week, because there are just new uh, new things uh, coming up. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, some. Let's say the terminology list that we use or follow. It mainly concerns our UI, uh, and that's not updated that much. Uh, I would say that we don't update it. Yeah, we don't update it that much. But when uh, there's something that one of us notices that could be improved, and uh, then uh, we have a regular sync meetings and. He or she can uh, she can raise the issue there, and we talk it uh, about it as a group, and then either we decide right away or we uh, do some consequent steps so that we find out which one is better. Okay, thank you. Let's go for another question. Adam asks, did you do any research for login, sign-in in Czech language? I think this is for you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this will be a very short answer. <laughs> uh, answer, fortunately, no, I, I haven't. Um, I would say that, or at least from my mind, I would say uh, Czech is a little bit simpler, at least for Přihlásit or Hlásit. But maybe there are other uh, other words, but I admit that I didn't do any research for Czech language in this. Okay, if someone has some uh, information for us regarding this, he, can, he or she can share with us. <laughs> okay. Um, another question is, are there any patterns in British versus American English concerning login or sign-in? Tome, do you know? Uh -huh. uh, I looked into this a little bit and I didn't find any uh, any specifics for either British or American English. I know that uh, for some words, like for example, Gmail shows trash in American English and bin in, uh, in, uh, in British English. Uh, but regarding login and sign in, I haven't found any uh, anything that would tell me that this is a matter of British or American English. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, I guess. Okay. So, some other question um, from Mian. Uh, my versus yours, your in a copy or CTAs, for example, show your contracts or show my contracts. So, any ideas on this one? Anyone of you? Right. Uh, this is actually something that we've been dealing with quite recently in our app uh, content. Okay. And uh, we decided to go with your approach. 
And that's simply because, as I said, we've kind of communicating with the user. So we're saying something uh, to them. So we're saying your, your something. And it's better to do it this way, even though it was a painful process for us, uh, kind of just because we've used to have my everywhere. And then we decided to drop it and only use it for something that's specific to the user when it's a button, like I want to do something, right? You can still keep it. But if it's something general or you're basically talking to the user, I I'd preferred, uh, I would prefer your in this case. Maybe one more thing that comes to my mind regarding this is also that if you use my a lot, then you really basically forbid yourself uh, from using we recommend or phrase like that because then you have uh, we and I and uh, stuff like that. So then the the first person is there in both uh, both sides of the conversation. So yeah, another reason to use your. <laughs> Okay, another question from Jan. Um, onboarding progress bar, would you show or hide steps in case there is more than five of them? Well, the general rule of thumb is to show the number of steps just because, as I said, the user wants to know what's ahead of them and uh, what's going to happen, how many steps there are. But there's another thing. Uh, onboarding shouldn't be that long, ideally. Users uh, don't pay attention to something that's uh, way too long. And five steps or more is a lot. And I know what I'm talking about because we have this in the, in the app currently and we're getting rid of it, actually. We're trying to move on to something quicker, uh, something that's shorter, like three steps or less, because uh, someone well no one will want to go through this uh it's just it's just way too long maybe you have a good reason for it but uh just just think about it okay thank you so i'm going to give it a few more seconds in case of some delay or someone uh, thinks of another question um you can also um turn on your speakers and ask like directly that's that's okay um so meanwhile um i would like to thank you all for bearing with us today uh we will definitely send you some follow-up email with the feedback form on the organi organization of this event as we are keen on improving of course um and in case uh, you're from uh, czech republic preferably Brno where we are based uh, we have some uh, open positions among them also content developers uh, and UX designers so feel free to check it out on our, on our website um, also if you want to stay in touch we write newsletters um, um, there we uh, inform about upcoming actions uh, and events uh, among other things and we also share our news on twitter under the Candico design account so feel free uh, to check it out and i can see that there's another question ah what will be the next topic and when okay um to be honest i don't know but <laughs> if you know about some speaker of you personally would like to speak uh, and have some topic uh, you can let us know and uh, we can organize it together um but at this point uh, we don't have anything planned i think <laughs> Okay, so if, okay, another question. So Lukáš asks, as for the open, oh, okay. Is it possible to get in as intern for UX design research even though there's no explicitly open position? Um, uh, currently, we don't have any open uh, positions for interns. Um, we will be opening uh, some intern positions for developers. Um, I don't think that <laughs> that is something that would that you would be interested in if you ask uh, uh, directly for UX design. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, no no uh, positions for interns right now. Sorry. Okay. Anyone else? 
then be shy and again um, speak up. <laughs> if not, then let me close it with a big thank you for um, yeah um, attending and uh, thank you for the speakers. It was really uh, great. And um, yeah, goodbye and take care all. <laughs>